The last time we wrote down the Lagrangian for the SYK model. Um, <clears throat> and what we discussed was that this model and, and tensor models, some Mellon diagrams, and so are solvable at leading order in 1 over n. Um, so today we're going to start the process of solving the model. Um, so what does it mean to solve the model? Uh, if, we, if we consider the partition function, <clears throat> write down the partition function. Uh, so, so we have fermions, so the partition function involves an integral of the fermions, e to the minus the action, which is the Lagrangian. And I had said yesterday that uh, the, the, the J is disorder averaged, so we perform an average over all the couplings. So normally we would just have this, but I then also average over the couplings. And what I'm writing down is the annealed version of SYK rather than the, than the quenched version, but it doesn't matter for what I'll say. Uh, so solving the model would mean that we can compute the partition function. Once we know how to compute the partition function, we could compute all correlation functions. Um, <clears throat> so if, if, if you forget about the J, if J was just some, some set of numbers, then, then clearly we wouldn't know how to compute the partition function because it would just be some theory with quartic interactions. Uh, so we would have to evaluate integrals that we don't know how to evaluate. We could, of course, start expanding perturbatively uh, the J term in the action bring it down, reduce it to Gaussian integrals, and then we could evaluate perturbatively, which is what we normally do. Um, that's not what we're going to do here, since we're aiming to do things non-perturbatively in, in the Tuft coupling. So, um, but one thing we do have here is, is this J integral, uh, and that's a Gaussian integral, so we can do it. So let me start by doing the J integral. Is this too loud? No? So I'm going to start by integrating out J. <clears throat> so my goal is to get as far as possible in evaluating this path integral. So integrating out J, uh, so, so here we have, so we have a Gaussian integral, here we have the Lagrangian, so we're going to get this term appearing at some time T1, and also appearing at some time t2, because uh, integrating out j, we get two copies. So, we'll get a term like <clears throat> um, in, in, the, in the exponent. Is this clear? The point is just, uh, so we'll have two of these guys, then, then this integral will contract the indices to be equal, and so we'll have a chi i, chi i, chi j, chi j, chi k, chi k, chi l, chi l. Those are all the same because all the indices are summed over, so we have a term like that. Um, and, and now you'll notice, I'll write the action more explicitly in a, in a minute. You'll notice that, um, that we now have an O-N symmetry uh, because this term is, is symmetric under O-N, which is what I was saying yesterday, that the model has O-N symmetry after disorder averaging. So, so in, the, in the current form, 
it's still not so easy to to analyze the action because we still have an integral over fermions and we still have a term like this, which we don't really know what to do with. So um, using the fact that we have an ON symmetry, let me introduce, so I'll introduce some new fields, my local fields. Um, I'll call them sigma tilde and G tilde. So I'm going to add, so I'm going to insert a term like this, which, which is one. So the reason I'm doing this will become apparent in a moment. I'll get something simple. But the point is, um, since what we have appearing here is, is chi i of tau 1, chi i of tau 2, with the sum from 1 to n, uh, it, it makes sense to, uh, to think we, we want to somehow get rid of the i index because we have an O-N symmetry. So there's this huge redundancy. So I introduce some new field g tilde, which I want to set equal uh, at, at least, uh, I want to set it equal to this, to this chi i of tau 1, chi i of tau 2, and I insert a Lagrange multiplier sigma. Uh, the kinetic term, chi i d tau chi, that's what you're referring to? That's right, I still have to do that integral, that's right. I, I'm so far just adding extra stuff to then simplify, that's right. So I'm, that's right. So, um, so I insert this, which is just an identity. Uh, you can think of the sigma integral as, as giving a delta function, and then the g integral just gives one. So I've just introduced additional fields. So now I have a path integral over chi, over sigma tilde and g tilde, the j I already did. Uh, and now, as you mentioned, I still need to do the chi integral, but now I can do the chi integral because, um, Chi only appears in a, so the, the point of doing this was that now this term, I can replace this by g tilde to the fourth, since I said, I interpreting that g is equal to this sum. And now chi only appears quadratically. It appears in the action quadratically. And, and instead of this thing, now this is no longer in terms of chi, it's in terms of g tilde. So the only other place that chi appears is, is here, which is quadratically. So I can integrate out chi. And then I get an effective action. Uh, so let me let me explain the terms here. So if if we just had the kinetic term chi d tau chi, uh, then doing the integral, integrating out the chi would give this log dead of d tau, um, right? Uh, we also but we also have this sigma chi chi, so sigma is like acting like a you could say a mass term. So I have log that d tau minus sigma uh, from doing the chi integral. Uh, then also there's the sigma g, that was just this uh, sigma g here. And then there's a j squared over 4g to the fourth, which, which was this term, because I replaced this sum over chi's by g. Tilde. Um, so that's it. So, um, so now we have, 
so we've just performed some some procedures. So we we had a path integral over chi's and j's. We did the j integral. Then we still had to do the chi integral. We then introduced some new fields by local field sigma tilde g tilde, and then we were able to do the chi integral. And so now our partition function consists of an integral over the by local fields path integral sigma tilde and g tilde of this effective action. Uh, so, so this is completely, so this action is completely equivalent to the SYK action. So we've gone from a theory of n fermions, which is what we started with, n fermions with these all to all uh, interactions, quartic interactions with this coupling, with, with a random coupling j, to, to a theory of bilocal fields with this action. So you could say that in principle we have solved SYK. The reason you could say that is because the the difficult part of one of the difficult things was that there was an n, so there were n fields, and now we have something equivalent which only has two fields. Um, so we've gotten rid of the n, which in some sense counts as solving. Um, No, this is, this is exact. Uh, this is just simply exact. Yeah, all the procedures I did um, were exact. Uh, there were no approximations. We just changed the different variables. This, this rewriting, you could say there's not much of an advantage since even though there's no n, now I have bilocal fields instead of local fields. But, but um, rewritten in this way, it makes we've used the ON symmetry. In the previous way of writing it, the ON symmetry wasn't manifest, whereas here it's manifest, so it's better. Um, so so now, now we can start asking about um, what happens perturbatively in 1 over N. And so we discussed yesterday uh, that at leading order in 1 over N, SYK sums Mellon diagrams, so we'd like to be able to see that. There's no ON anymore, there's no N. Um, the N, there's no N dependence here, it's just there's an, this is I effective over N, so there's an overall N out front, and then this. Uh, so, so that's right, that, that was one of the advantages. This is nice because now it's easy to expand perturbatively in 1 over N, since, since there's an N out front, that means at large N, one can look at the saddle. Uh, since, so now our partition function I effective over N times N. I effective over N has no N dependence, <clears throat> so there's a large N here. So it's dominated by, by the saddle, because there's a large n out front. Um, n is playing the role of 1 over h bar when we have a, um, when we do quantum mechanics, then uh, we recover the classical equations of motion in the limit of h bar goes to zero, because we can take the saddle of the action, which, which, which gives the old Lagrange equations. And so similarly here, at large n, um, at leading order, we just look at the saddle. Uh, and those are the equations. Yes? This line? Ah, this is just proportional to one. This is something I just made up. Uh, I just, uh, this is proportional to one, and so I can insert this. Um, yes, and so I just insert that into the original. Okay, good. Let me, let me go again. Um, so, so we started here, and the first thing we did was, was do the J integral. Uh, so doing the J integral, we have dJ, ijkl. 
Um, let me drop all the indices since it will be too much to write. Uh, I'll just put G capital I to indicate all the indices. So we have G capital I squared over J squared schematically. I'll drop the N cube. And then a minus J chi 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 chi. Now I do the J integral. So this let me, this you can imagine completing the square. So this is e to the minus j i minus chi 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 of n t squared. Uh, so I complete the square. So this j i squared I get here. Uh, then the second term j i times all the chi's is this term. I'm dropping most factors. But then I need to add uh, this, this chi to the fourth at time t squared. Um, I need to add that because this is the extra term I picked up by completing the square. Really, these, this occurs at what time and then the other term is at a different time since there's an integral over times. And, and, that's, and, that's what gave, um, and that's what gave what I wrote earlier, a term that's e to the exponential of, of um, i i of tau 1, i i of tau 2. Squared. Um, so, so that's what we had then. Then I introduced this, uh, which, which sets g equal to this sum chi i tau 1, chi i tau 2. So then I replace, uh, sorry, this was to the, f uh, uh, no, 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 I didn't write it correctly. Uh, Then I replace this with, with g tilde to the fourth, and, and that's what, uh, what appeared there. Um, if you go through and do this with indices, then we'll get precisely that. Uh, here. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so this, this is equivalent to the original action, and we have the capital N out front. So now we, at leading order in 1 over N, we can take the saddle. So to take the saddle, I vary the effective action with respect to sigma tilde and with respect to g tilde. Uh, and I get two equations. So the first one is that, so let me call sigma tilde and g tilde at the saddle to be just sigma and g. So the first equation I get is here? No. I divided by n, yeah. Um, so when I take the saddle, if I vary this with respect to, with respect to g, g occurs here and here. So varying this, I just get sigma. And varying this, I get j squared g cubed. So that's uh, this equation. Now I vary with respect to sigma. And I get uh, g inverse of omega is minus i omega minus sigma omega. So this, the second equation, when I vary this with respect to sigma, here there's a log dat. So let me write that as trace log. Then I take the derivative of trace log. That gives trace 1 over d tau minus sigma. I then switch to momentum space frequency space, and then the d tau becomes minus i omega. So that's that term. And varying this with respect to sigma tilde, I just get a g, um, which, which, is, which is this term. Good? Yes? 
Uh, good, 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 good. So, um, so at the saddle, I assume that is just a function of tau one minus tau two. So, so that's what I assume. And then, and then sigma of omega is is the Fourier transform because then there's just one time. So we make that assumption that that um, that it only depends on the time difference, which which is reasonable, since we have translation invariance. Um, good. So so these are the the saddle equations. Um, as, as I discussed yesterday and as, and as David wrote down last week, um, David also wrote down these equations by summing melons. So they should be the same equations and indeed you can recognize that they're the same equations. So the second, and now you can see why I called them sigma tilde and g tilde. So the second equation just says that uh, g inverse of omega is minus i omega minus sigma. That's just the definition of, of the self-energy. So this equation Let me just remind you. So G of omega, the propagator is the free propagator, which is I over omega. So let me let me do it like this. So the free propagator plus the free propagator, the self-energy, free propagator. So it's just the geometric sum, and doing this geometric sum, you get this equation. So this is just standard with the self-energy. So that's that equation. So this equation is obvious. The first equation is the one that's interesting. It says that the self-energy is j squared g cubed. Uh, so sigma of tau j squared g of tau cubed. So that just means that sigma let me write uh, the propagator as this full line. Star. So it says that sigma is j squared g cubed, which is, which is the equation for summing melons. So that is, if, we were, if I told you we were summing melons, then, then these are the melons. How do I know that sigma is the self-energy? Good, good, good. Um, I know, well, I look, so these are the saddle equations, and now I physically interpret them. And I wasn't expecting an equation. The definition, the way we define the self-energy in field theory is through this definition. That is how we define the self-energy, and that is this equation. And so it, it's obvious that I should identify sigma with the self-energy. Um, uh, and then I look at this equation. So this is standard. This would always occur. And then I look at this equation, and this is very special to test yk to the mod. We're dealing with that the self-energy is in turn expressed as g cubed, which, which is the equation I had before that, that I'm summing melons. So if you start iterating these equations, then you'll generate all null and diagrams. So by iterate, I mean, so, uh, so sigma is, is g cubed, which you could say, okay, how does that help you? But you know that g, well, you're trying to find g, so you can start by iterating. So first you take g to be the free propagator, then you insert that into this equation, that tells you the self-energy is g cubed. So then you get a diagram like this. Um, and then you just keep iterating. Then for the self-energy, use this guy, insert that into here, and you'll get diagrams like this, and so on. And so you'll generate all Mellon diagrams. So well, I should have said I'm in Euclidean space. Uh, so everything should be real, and everything is real. Um, yes, everything is real, as it should be. That's true. I then rotate the contour. 
or something of that sort. Um, yeah. Yeah, I will quote it at some stage. <laughs> Uh, it's fine. Um, okay, so so now uh, now that we have this this effective action, we can in principle compute um, our correlation functions. So, well, the observables would now be in the original SYK model. The observables were correlation functions of the chi's. Whereas, whereas now our only fields are sigma tilde and g tilde, and so the observables are correlation functions of, of g tilde and sigma tilde, for instance, g tilde of tau 1, tau 2, g tilde of tau 3, tau 4. This is some quantity we could compute now. Uh, so, so, to co so to compute this, so one does the path integral with these two g's inserted, uh, with this action, so we would compute it by by perturbatively expanding sigma tilde and g tilde about the saddle. Yes, uh, and then in this way we could compute any correlation function of sigma tilde and g tilde that we like. So the higher, the more sigma tilde and g tilde we we want, uh, the the more terms we need to keep when expanding about the saddle. So that's what I mean by saying that, in principle, um, we've now solved the model, since any correlation function we can compute, though the actual technical steps will be non-trivial. The two-point function was easy, and then the four-point function will get a little harder, as you can see, since the action is non-trivial. Very good. Indeed, g tilde, g tilde is like chi, chi of tau 1, chi, chi sum over i. Chi. So this is like sum ij, chi i tau 1, 1 over n squared, chi i tau 2, chi j tau 3, chi j tau 4. So this is like the four-point function of the chi's. Yeah, so, so this, I just inserted g tilde, the g tilde over there, and so this, this has it. So this is, um, so this has O and symmetry since I sum over the i's and the j's. So to be more specific, with this action we can compute, with this effective action we can compute any O n invariant quantity. Um, which, which is, so with the original SYK action you could have said we can compute more, we, can, we could have computed the correlator chi i, chi j, well, that wouldn't matter. We could have computed some non- we could have computed chi i, chi i, chi j, chi j, no sum over i and j. Here we can't. We can only compute own invariant things with this action, since it's own invariant, but that's all we want anyway. That's right. That's right. You could, you could ask, what about this when, I, when, I, when you don't do the sum over i and j? It's, it's basically the same thing, but yes. Okay, so, so we've... So we have this effective action, but uh, it's a little difficult to work with. And as, as I've emphasized, the thing we're interested in is the, the strong coupling limit, the infrared of SYK. So let's see how we can simplify further. Because we had um, a disorder average over the coupling J, this allowed us to do the J integral, which, which then gave something simpler. Uh, because we had an ON symmetry, uh, we could introduce these sigma tilde and g tilde fields, and then we got something like this. And then from, from this effective action, we saw this remarkable property of SYK that at the saddle we sum only melons. So, so that, those were the things that led to this. Now we, we will notice an additional property, which is that conformal invariance in the infrared. Uh, so I, I'm going to show that now. So the thing that we notice is that in the infrared, we can drop. 
we can drop D tau uh, appearing here. Um, so, so one way of seeing why we can drop it is I'll drop it, then solve the saddle point equations to see what the solution is, and then see that it was self-consistent to drop it. That was that this term was indeed small. So, so dropping ah, the other saddle equation. Let me write it down. That I got from this was g omega inverse is minus i omega minus sigma omega. So in terms of the saddle equations, if I drop the d tau and the action, that means I'm dropping i omega here. Uh, so I drop i omega, and then I can solve these equations. And the solution So, so I've defined tau 1, 2 to just be tau 1 minus tau 2 to simplify notation. And, and b is some constant, which is known, but I'm not going to write down. Uh, so you can check that if you plug this into these two equations, it works. Well, after dropping the i omega, if you plug that into there, it works. It's a solution of the equations. So... Uh, so this is the, the two-point function, and then with this solution, you can check that it wasn't like, justified to drop the d tau. Um, so, so what happens is the two-point function in the UV, at, at weak coupling, the two-point function was g naught of tau, which was one-half sine tau. That was just the two-point function from free minor under fermions with an action chi d tau chi was just one-half sine tau. The sine appears because the fermions are anti-commuting, and the two-point function is time-ordered. So this was in the UV, and then in the infrared, uh, now it's one over j tau to the two delta, where delta is, is one quarter. The reason I wrote it like this is, we look at this two-point function, and this has the form of, of a conformal two-point function. Uh, so the field chi has, has acquired dimension delta, one quarter. So as we do the RG flow from the UV to the infrared, the dimension of chi goes from zero, which, which is what, what it was in the UV, to one quarter in the infrared. Good. So I have, so here I have a coupled set of equations. So in the infrared, I drop minus i omega. So one equation is in, is in frequency space, the other is in time space. Um, you can take the Fourier transform of, of this and insert it into here, and then you just get one integral equation. Uh, alternatively, what, what you can do is, is uh, so I claim that this is a solution uh, for, for g of tau. Now you can compute g of omega by taking the Fourier transform. So from this uh, will be omega to the 2 delta minus 1 sine omega by just taking uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, so, so plug. Uh, so, that's g of omega. So sigma of omega, by this equation, is the inverse of that. So omega to the one minus two delta. Now take the Fourier transform of that to get sigma of tau, and now check that that's equal to g of tau cube, and you'll see that it works. Okay. So, so I've demonstrated two of the three thing, things I said yesterday about SYK. The first is that I is that it's solvable uh, because we've basically solved it, uh, or at least we now see how one can proceed to systematically solve it. And the second point was that one has conformal invariance at strong coupling in the infrared, which we see as well uh, because the two-point function looks like a conformal two-point function. Um, in, in fact, there's, there's a subtlety which, which occurs. 
um, which is that we don't quite have a CFT in the infrared. So let me explain that. It appears we, we have a, a one-dimensional CFT, and a one-dimensional CFT has SL2R invariance. Um, SL2R should be familiar from yesterday's lecture by Freddie. Um, that's just the conformal group in one dimension. Um, but the subtlety that I mentioned is that, so we got this by dropping the detail in the action. If we drop In the action, then, in fact, we have um, the resulting action has time reparameterization variance, diffeomorphism invariance in one dimension. So, so what I mean, what I mean by this is, if you send tau to f of tau, and at the same time send g tilde of tau one tau two to So, so send, time reparameterization means that if you send tau to some function of tau and then transform g tilde in this way and transform sigma tilde in the same way but with, with this to the power of q minus 1, then that action will be invariant after having dropped the d tau. So in the infrared, we have emergent time reparameterization invariants. That's right, after dropping the detail. Perhaps the easiest way of ver verifying this is to look at the saddle of the action, which were the schwinger dyson equations I wrote and then erased, uh, and, then, and then simply doing the substitution. So, turn, so I had two equations, um, g of omega inverse is minus omega minus sigma of omega. So turn those two equations into one integral equation, just in position space, and then do this transformation, and you'll see that the integral equation is invariant. So, so, what, so um, what this means is once we find one saddle point, which, which is the one I wrote, that, that g of tau is 1 over this one, we in fact have, have an infinite number because you can just do this transformation and generate more solutions. So we have a space. We have a space of solutions. And moving between them has no, ener has no energy cost. What I mean is that since the action is invariant, you can, you can change the solution by this transformation. The action doesn't change. So there's a whole family of solutions, all with the same action. For, for, for practical purposes, what this means is that if I were to drop the d tau and then proceed to start computing correlation functions, like the two-point function of the, J, the g's, which is like the four-point function of the chi's, I would find divergences. Um, because, because of the space of solution. solutions.
Yes. Yes. Um, so, so if one is practically minded, uh, you well. If one is practically minded, you don't even need this effective action. You could just say that yesterday I said for the two-point function you sum melons. So we want to compute the four, six, eight-point function. So you would just say draw the Feynman diagrams. Uh, you know what those are? Well, you can figure out what they are and just start summing the diagrams using and sum the diagrams for, for instance, the four-point function, and we'll compute it in the infrared as strong couplings. So for the propagator, just use this. Sum the diagrams, you'll get something, and move on. And what you'll find is that the thing that you get will be infinite. There will be a divergence. Um, of course, the actual, the actual four-point function of SYK is not divergent. It can't be divergent. It's a well-defined theory. But, but um, the way in which we took, by this naive and reasonable procedure, the infrared limit, we generated divergence, which isn't actually there. And, and the, the explanation for this can be seen from this effective action viewpoint. So that, that's the reason I mentioned it, that, that we don't quite have a CFT1 in the infrared, because if we try, if we try to just drop d tau and compute stuff, we'll get divergences. So, so, so we need to... So what, what we want to do, we still want to stay as close as possible to the infrared as we can, since, since that's where things simplify, but, but we need to slightly account um, when we do this transformation of tau goes to f of tau, the full action, including the d tau, is, is of course not time reparameterization invariant. There isn't an action cost to doing this reparameterization. It just goes away if we drop the d tau. So what we're going to try to do is, is keep, is account for, for the change in the action when we do the time reparameterization, but account for it out to lowest order. Just in the infrared, just compute in the infrared what the, the action cost is. Yes. Um, so, so this, so we're going to call this the soft mode. I believe Kitai have called this the soft mode uh, of of this this mode of of f of tau. So we need to account. So, so we want to compute compute the cost, the action cost. Of tau going to f of tau uh, in the infrared. So I'm just trying to get the the simplest, the simplest theory I can, and the simplest one is in the infrared. But I can't go fully to the infrared, so I'm just going to go. Um, as deep in the infrared as this is legitimate. So, so that's why I need to do this procedure. Um, so that's what I'm going to compute now. Uh, the, the action cost when, when tau goes to f of tau, uh, close to the infrared where you drop the d tau. So, so to simplify notation, let me define sigma, little sigma, as as d tau delta tau one minus tau two. So this term, this this term. So so the stuff uh, appearing here, you should think of as a matrix. It's clear for the sigma tilde because it's a function of two times. But this d tau should should also be thought as a function of two times. It's it's the operator d tau and the delta function of tau one minus tau two. So to make that clear that it's a function of two times, I'm going to define little sigma of tau one comma tau two as this operator the one appearing here. Yeah, um, th that's right. You, this is, uh, so by detail I mean the operator, uh, and this is the delta function. So when it acts on, yes. So I, I just introduced this to simplify notation, and then I change variables in, in the path integral with that effective action. I change variables. Sigma tilde 
goes to sigma tilde plus sigma. Um, so doing this variable change, this d tau disappears. And instead, so I do that change, that disappears. Here, I get sigma tilde plus sigma. So that extra term, let me write down here, is 1 half d tau 1, d tau 2. Sigma to sigma tau one two. So I haven't done anything, I just rewrote the action. Uh, and, and the reason I rewrote it in this form is as you can see the first line is what we said is invariant under time reparameterization. Tau goes to f of tau. And the second line is not. And so going to the, the deep infrared of, of, dropping, of dropping the d tau, that, that's dropping sigma, that's dropping the second line. So we want to, so you can think of the second line as a perturbation of, of the infrared action. So we want to account, account for this term, but account for it um, expanding perturbatively around the infrared to get the first correction to um, to this CFT that, that we found. Say again? Yes, G tilde. So, so, so since I want to account for this term at leading order, close to the infrared, what I'm going to use for g tilde is, is the solutions that we found in the infrared when we fully dropped this term. So that was, that was, uh, that was what I raised, 1 over tau 1 minus tau 2 to the 2 delta, and this entire space of solutions that we get by, by sending tau to f of tau. We take v tilde to be the IR solution. Um, so this was the IR solution. This solves, for any f of tau, solves the, the Schwinger-Dyson equations, the saddle equations of the action in infrared when you drop uh, this term. So when you drop this term, this is a solution of, of the resulting saddle equations. So I want to expand this term um, using, at leading order, I use this as, so I stick this into here and compute this. And that's the correction to the action near the infrared. Um, so that's what I want to calculate. So this this sigma, if you recall, was was a was had a delta function. So this uh, so this is going to pick out the term in, in g tilde that's that's for, for which tau one and tau two are close. Yes. So I expand g tilde about. Uh, one, two, much less than one. Uh, so, so very small. Uh, tau one minus tau two. So I define tau plus to be tau one plus tau two over two. And then I just expand f of tau as f of tau plus plus tau one two over two f prime of tau plus. Da, da, da. Just a Taylor expansion uh, of these terms, of these terms here about tau plus. So I just take the time difference between tau one and tau two is small, and I Taylor expand the terms here. 
Um, what was this? So, so doing that, I find, so doing this Taylor expansion, which is just simple algebra, we find that G tilde is sine tau one two over tau one two to the two delta one plus delta over six. Uh, so, where the Schwarzian so so doing this so this we need to Taylor expand to third order, so Taylor expand f of tau one and f of tau two about tau plus, uh, then stick that into here, then expand the resulting expression in tau one two. Uh, and as you would expect, you get 1 over tau 1, 2 to the 2 delta, and, and then 1 plus, plus some power series in tau 1, 2, and the first, the first term that appears is tau 1, 2 squared, and it's multiplied by, by some stuff with derivatives of f, which has name, which is the Schwarzian, and it's this combination of derivatives. So that's what you find. So, so this, this piece, good. So this piece I was interested in here, uh, now, so I stick this into here, and then I do the integral over tau 1 and tau 2. Um, and and uh, this was a derivative of a delta function, and so what I get uh, is so sticking this into this and doing the integral is, is what we'll call the Schwarzian action. I just so with this tau one two, and then the derivative the derivative of the delta function that integral just gives a number, and and I get this the Schwarzian. So here the, instead of tau one and tau two, I switch to tau one, tau plus and tau one minus tau two. I do the tau one minus tau two integral, and I'm left with the tau plus integral, which, well, I can just call it tau plus here. Um, good. So we've computed. Uh, so. We said we want to go to the infrared since things simplify. At leading order, that means we can just drop this. But then we said that's not so good because then we'll encounter divergences. Uh, so then we, we compute to first order what happens when you don't drop this and you get the Schwartz in action. So one comment I should make is that in, in deriving the Schwartz in action, what I did was slightly illegitimate because, well, I'm expanding around the infrared, but this sigma is a very UV thing because it's a derivative of a delta function, whereas I'm trying to expand around the infrared. So in doing this perturbation, I sort of mixed um, UV and infrared. So one needs to be more careful in doing this, which I wasn't. Um, so one can be more careful, uh, though there's a limit to how careful one can be because, uh, because it's still not fully legitimate. So this coefficient is in practice fixed numerically by just numerically solving um, numerically solving for the, the schwinger dyson equations for the full two-point function and then fixing the coefficient. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. The, this, the argument, without being careful, all that this argument shows is that you get something which is multiplying a Schwarzian and, and the coefficient is a bit mysterious or this factor of one over J is also mysterious in the way it did it. But being done carefully, uh, this was done by Kitaev and Sue recently. Um, one can get this. One can also get the Schwarzian in other ways, but, but this seems like the conceptually the clearest. It's just we want, we want as close as possible, we want to get as close as possible to the infrared and and we're forced to keep this, this correction. So, so the conclusion, the, the conclusion is, conclusion? Is, is in the infrared, 
And then Fred, we have a CFT1 plus a soft mode, which is described by the Schwarzian action. So that's the theory that we have um, in the infrared, and that's the one we're going to study from now on. That's right. That's right. exactly. So, so this perturbation is, is, is outside that regime. So in practice, what it should do is replace, is replace this delta function by something that's regulated, and you stretch it out. Uh, so that you can apply the perturbation, something like this. Um, yes, yeah, so put, put differently, one could write down the full Schrodinger Dyson equations for this action, which, which is what we wrote down a minutes ago, g omega inverse equals minus i omega minus sigma of omega, uh, sigma of tau is j squared g of tau cubed, and just solve those numerically. One could do this. Analytically, you can't solve it because it's an integral equation, which is difficult, but you can solve it numerically. And then what you'll find is that at, in the infrared at very large j, it starts looking like 1 over j tau to the 2 delta. And then as you go to slightly smaller j, but still large, then there's a correction, which is 1 over j tau to the 2 delta plus 1 with some number. And knowing that number basically fixes this number. That's right. So really, I should. So this, this, so this tells me that. So this tells me that I need. So this is for certain that uh, it has a delta function. So I need to get tau one two to be small. But then I say, okay, but um, I want to expand around the infrared. So as small as for us, it is small. The range of validity of of my infrared solution, this one, is stops at. I can't go to time differences any smaller than one over j. So I, I need some sort of compromise. This is pushing to times as small as possible, but the range of validity of what I'm plugging in doesn't work. Why can't? Ah, because, so the, the point was in the infrared, so the reason we got this conformal solution to the two-point function, one over j tau to the two delta, was we dropped, we dropped this last term. And it's justified to drop this last term in the infrared at strong coupling. Alternatively, I'm dropping, to get this conformal solution, I drop I omega. So that means I'm going to very small energies, because I omega is then small. I mean, small energies, which is the same as strong coupling. Uh, so it's only then that it's justified. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Um, that's right. So let, let me let me say this more clearly. Uh, so the two-point function. So it satisfies some integral equation. We we can only solve the equation numerically. What we know is that that in the UV, when it's just free fermions, it's one half sine tau. The UV is is small coupling. The, the coupling has dimensions one. So I should talk about j tau. So when j tau is much less than 1, I know that the solution of those integral equations is 1 half sine tau. I also know that at very strong coupling, it's sine tau over j tau to the 2 delta. Uh, because at very strong coupling, I can drop the i omega in the Schwinger Dyson equations in the integral equations and then solve them and then check that this is a solution. So I know these two things um, that I just know analytically. And what I was just saying is that we discovered that in normal cases, if we were in higher dimension, then we could just go to the infrared, and that would be good enough. We could compute stuff, it would be finite. Here, because we're in one dimension, there are some special things that happen, and we can't fully go to the infrared. So then I need, I want to go to j tau as much, not quite infinity, but slightly less than infinity, so I need to compute um, in between here and here, but closer to this end. And that's right. I, I, I are. I, yes. Your question is beyond the order of approximation of this derivation, uh, which was just to get the, there's a Schwarzian. Um, 
So in, in, in the way Mel DeSena Stanford fixed this coefficient was not by doing this, but by computing the corrections to the two-point function, and then, and then arguing that it's the Schwarzian by other means. Well, in fact, Kitaev knew before then that it's the Schwarzian because it's SL2R invariant. But up until this, this most recent derivation of, of Kitaev and Su, at least to me, it wasn't really clear why the Schwarzian is coming out, aside from these general arguments. Um, so, so this is the clearest way. Um, but, but not the simplest technically. Okay, so, so now we have, um, in the infrared we have a CFT1 plus this, plus the soft mode, which is the Schwarzian. So what I want to focus on, so, so now we want to um, really solve this. So I can write down all the correlation functions in, in the infrared. Um, and so the, the, the piece that I'll focus on is, is the CFT piece, that piece. Uh, since then, we know the functional form of all the correlation functions because they're fixed by conformal invariance. Uh, this is what we're always taught, that the CFT, you specify uh, the dimensions of the operators and the o OP coefficients, and you've solved everything in the CFT. Uh, so here we want to put that into practice in SYK. Uh, since it's solvable, we just want to solve it and, and get all the OP coefficients um, and know the full theory. So, so let me... So, so before implementing this in SYK and, and computing all correlation functions, the force, et cetera, let, let me just um, remind you why we make the statement that in CFTs, mm, once, once you specify the dimensions of all the operators and the OP coefficients, you know everything. So the discussion for the, next, for the rest of the lecture will be general. It will, will just be a general discussion of CFTs. And applied to SYK will be next time. three-point functions. And the three-point functions of the primary operators. So the three-point functions, uh, their functional form is fixed by conformal invariance. Um, to be the following. So I'm just writing down the general expression for a CFT three-point function of primaries. That's right. So, there, so there'll be two sectors, one which is the CFT and one which is the soft mode. Um, so, so right now I'm just discussing the CFT part. And so I'm just making general statements. Oops. What we expect CFT correlation functions to look like, um, and and the CFT correlation function of a primary of three operators takes this functional form. So the functional form is fixed uh, up to a coefficient. Um, so you can easily verify that this is the correct functional form for a CFT three-point function. So it needs to satisfy time translation invariance, which it easily does. Um, the, 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 it satisfies scale invariance, um, which, which you can see because the dimensions of the operators are delta 1, delta 2, delta 3. And if you sum these, these three exponents, you get delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3. Uh, so that's the second one. And the final one is one needs to check inversion, the special conformal. Uh, and, and that's what fixes it to be so to do that, you can you send all the times to their inverse and see how it transforms, and that's where this precise combination of dimensions comes in. Um, anyway, this, this is fairly standard. So, so the thing I want to explain is why, why knowing these dimensions and these coefficients of the primaries is sufficient to then compute all correlation functions, why that encodes all the data of the CFT.
So, so it would be convenient to use the language of the OPE. So consider the OPE of, of two of these operators, delta tau one. We can write this as delta one, delta two, delta k. So, so the point of the OPE is that we, we have two operators, we take their times to be close to each other, and then we say, okay, let's replace this by, um, by operators at, at a single time, since these times are close, and we need to replace it by some set of operators. So, so instead of inserting these operators, we insert an operator, um, some set of operators, O delta K, where we sum over K, some coefficients. So this is the primary, and then these are descendants, the derivatives of O. So that's the OP. Let me call this C delta 1, delta 2, delta K, tau 1, 2. So um, this is just a Taylor expansion. So tau 1, 2, D2, then the next term will be tau 1, 2 squared, the second derivative, and so on. Uh, so this is the sum of primaries plus descendants. That's what we have. Yes? because I'm discussing CFTs. Good, so I'll discuss that when we get to SYK. So first, I'll discuss, um, uh, I'm just discussing CFTs, and then we'll apply that to SYK. So SYK is essentially a CFT plus, plus a Schwarzschild piece, uh, and so, it's, so we need to understand CFTs. So, so this, this function here, so you could ask how I know the coefficients that go here, the one-half, et cetera. So this is fully fixed uh, by the three-point function. So what, what I mean is, uh, so put some numbers there, say you don't know the one-half, put some, some number, uh, and then insert that into here. And now you have a sum of, of two-point functions because this O of delta one, O of delta two will get replaced by, by this by this O of delta K, and then the derivative of O of delta K, and so on. Uh, so then on the left, you have two-point functions, those you know what they're equal to. And then on the right, just Taylor expand this, this thing around small uh, tau 1, 2. So just Taylor expand this around small tau 1, 2. And in this way, you fix all the, all the coefficients appearing here. So in other words, we, we fully know this function. So, I'm going to use the shorthand for the OPE uh, that O of delta one, O of delta two, is some C delta one, delta two. So this is shorthand for, for the actual exact equation, for the OP. So you can think of the shorthand as just writing, as just writing the primary, but one should keep in mind that really there's a sum of primary and descendants, and, and we know all the coefficients of the descendants once we know the coefficient of the primary. Um, good. So, so, now, so now any correlation function that you have, um, Suppose you have a four-point function. And you want to know what it looks like. Or, well, really, you, you're given all the CFT data, the, the dimensions and the OPE coefficients. And now you're asked to find the four-point function, which you can do, supposedly, since that was supposed to encode all data about the CFT. So you look at this four-point function, 
and just apply apply that formula. Uh, so now consider tau one two and tau three four to be small. Um, and and just apply that formula. Well, really, you don't need them to be small, but yeah. Um, so. Well, let me write it like this. So we apply that formula. Um, and let me call this F delta. Where F delta So that's after. So let me explain this equation. So I, so I apply. I use that formula for these two terms. So I get O of delta one, O of delta two, as some c delta one, delta two, delta this capital C operator of tau one two d two. Uh, that's just that formula. Then I apply the formula to these two guys. I get c of delta three, delta four, delta, and then a capital C of tau three four, delta four, uh, and. And I also had this O of delta k from this guy at tau 2, and, and an O of delta k from these guys at tau 4. And I compute their correlation function. It's a two-point function. That gives 1 over tau 2, 4 to the 2 delta. Yes. Uh, and so this, this, this whole thing, this is some, some function you can compute. And this is a hypergeometric function. And that's what I call this F delta, delta 1 through delta 4. Uh, so this is the conformal block. And it's the hypergeometric function 2F1 by just doing this procedure. Because this, this you know, is just the Taylor expansion in tau 1, 2, and D2. You know the coefficients. So you can do this, compute all the terms, sum the series, you'll get a hypergeometric function. Um, so, so this is, so now we see why we know all correlation functions, any correlation function you like, just keep applying the OPE, uh, and then the correlation function will be the OPE coefficients um, and, and the conformal blocks. So one can do this for higher point functions as well. So schematically, we can say that, that this is the sum over delta. Delta 1 over 2. So, so the operator delta 1, delta 2, of dimensions delta 1, delta 2 goes into the operator O delta. This guy goes into O delta, so we exchange this. These aren't Feynman diagrams. This is just a schematic representation of, of this equation. Three-point functions, really these coefficients. You now know all correlation functions. Um, and because they're fixed by conformal variance, so it, it's, it's very nice since well, if, if, um, if we were just asking, if we wanted to compute correlation functions in SYK, not in the infrared, when it's not a CFT, um, it would be very difficult to do, in part because we don't even know what the functional form should be of the correlation functions. Um, whereas if it's a CFT, in the, which it is in the infrared, then, then we know, we completely know the functional form of all correlation functions. It's just a question of getting the coefficients. So that's why if it's a CFT, there's at least hope of solving it, of being able to write down all correlation functions, which is our goal. Um, so, so, so this is often discussed that a CFT is specified by the dimensions and the three-point functions, but we almost never know these quantities for CFTs of interest, and, and the bootstrap, which you heard about last week, one, one, uses, one uses consistency requirements about the OP to place bounds, bounds on these coefficients. Uh, so that's, that you can do. Um, so what, 
what we're going to do in the next lecture is, is with SYK, we'll sum all the Feynman diagrams and then literally get the coefficients. Um, so so we'll, 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 write, um, we'll write it in the form that we expect. Yes? I will, so um, I'll actually be computing the higher point functions by summing Feynman diagrams, but it's effectively the same as the bilocal operators. Um, that's right. Um, so so uh, computing, so we had this bilocal action, so to compute all the correlation functions, um, well, we outlined how to do it, but then solving those equations will be non-trivial. Um, so you'll have to invert some operators uh, and, and inverting those operators will be will be the non-trivial step. In, in fact, in fact, I can just so so one thing we'll we'll do in the next lecture is compute the SYK four-point function. Um, so the the four-point function will be a sum of diagrams like this ladder diagrams. And so on. Um, I'll explain why why it's this. Uh, so one can define the kernel to be this operator, which just so it looks like a geometric series. So let me define this operator, which you should think of as a matrix going between these two times to these two times. So so this four point function is really one over one minus the kernel. Uh, and this is what you immediately get from from the effective action. So um, conceptually, it's done. So the only thing we need to do is, is understand what this means and, and how you take the inverse of 1 minus the kernel when the kernel is really a function of times. Um, so, yes. So, so the, the goal will be, indeed, to go from this effective action in, in which one can easily write down equations of this form, the correlation functions, and to turn those into a set of numbers the OP coefficients, to then be able to write down all correlation functions. Okay, any more questions? Okay.